Hello, hello, vet rehabbers. It's so good to see you all back. And today we have Dr. Kent Allen with us on our equine platform, and we're giving you this free webinar. And um, Kent is, how are you today, Kent? It's so lovely to see you again. I'm good. I'm I'm ready to go. That is great news. So we do have a slight delay on the platform today. Anyone, if you have any troubles, just pop a little message to me in your message box down the side of the screen. I will just convey the message to Kent. We will get through this bit by bit, but please just let me know if you have any hassles. If you are a new member to the online pet health family, please just um, Remember, we do have time at the end of the webinar for questions. Again, you can top the, um, type any messages into your questions box and we will ask Kent any questions at the end of his lecture and we'll set some time aside at the end of lecture to answer those questions for you. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Kent, to tell us a little bit about, more about yourself before you begin your lecture. Over to you, Kent. Thanks, Michelle. Um, one second here. It seems uh, your battery's now running low as well. We've got all these, is now running low. Sorry all about those that. technical gremlins today, but don't worry, everyone. We will get through this and we will get the presentation up and running. It seems like we've had hiccup after hiccup. Okay. There we uh, go. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'm Dr. Ken Allen and I'm in Middleburg, Virginia. Um, and I have been practicing on sport horses for about 40 years. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing this a little bit about um, what, what we're doing in our practice. We were one of the first practices back in uh, 2000 to get a, uh, a high energy focused shockwave machine. And we have been using it since then for 19 years now. And uh, I'm gonna share with you a little bit about how it works, how we use it. Uh, it's been a real boon to us in our sport horse practice. And it's a great way to rehabilitate injuries, bring horses back and uh, heal them to where they go forward and um, become sound and, and do great. So, I'm ready to go ahead and start chatting with you all about it if you'd like. That's great. Thank you, Kent. I'm going to switch your camera off. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Okay, so what we're going to talk about a little bit here is um, the equine athlete. And again, what we're looking for here as we go forward um, is how we can make these horses sound. And sorry, just having a little technical problem on advancing the slide. You can try just clicking anywhere on your screen for the first time and then maybe on your keyboard after that. Sometimes there does give a hiccup. Okay, there we go. Got it. Okay, so this is a little um, schematic that we did some years ago in talking about how to use, and Burstron is one of the manufacturers of Shockwave. It happens to be the one we use, but we'll talk a little bit about the types of Shockwaves out there that are available, and then we'll also talk about what, what we're using them for. Um, Shockwaves split into high energy and low energy, and the low energy is unfocused and the high energy is focused. And that just talks about where you get these sound waves. And remember that that's what a shockwave is. It's a very short duration sound wave. And a lot of people like to think about it that it's electrical. It's actually in the machine we use, it is generated by a spark inside the probe, uh, but then very quickly that is goes to a sound wave. And so it's a spark generating the cavitation in the liquid, then it becomes a sound wave and the sound wave can go to various depths and then have these effects. And what you see here are all the various areas in the horse that we use it in the feet, 
in the uh, suspensory areas, certainly along anywhere where there's arthritis, such as the hock, and then up into the back where we use it quite a little bit, and also the neck. And off to the right there, you can see these various depths uh, that we see uh, uh, that we can focus the probe to. Um, so again, low frequency acoustic pressure wave, and what that is creating is compressive and shear loads and cavitation in the tissue. So I promise you, I've only got a couple slides in here of the hard science, and then we get on to how we're using it. Um, but so the power, you know, everything has units that you're measuring it in. And here you're measuring millijoules per millimeter squared. And typically we're using somewhere between 0.1 and 0.3 uh, of that uh, energy density. And you want to be careful not to use higher energies, uh, but the machines are designed to operate in the normal settings. Um, because those can damage tissue. Um, and then the focus shock waves have much better penetration than the low energy or the radial systems. Um, so again, here's another slide of the hard science, uh, but it's important to know what these tissue effects are. And so if you look at these acronyms here, this is um, tissue growth factors and insulin-like growth factors and nitric oxide, nitric oxide synthesis. And uh, this is the cytokine soup that makes things heal and grow. And so shockwave has very positive effects upon all that. And so what it does is right below there is it's, it's affecting the bone precursor cells, mesenchymal cells. It angiogenesis is increasing the blood flow and collagen one and collagen type three production are things that we want in trying to heal an injury, particularly of a tendon nature. And then a reduction in these matrix metalloproteinases, which are inflammatory. Uh, markers, and we don't want those. And then substance P, which is involved in pain control, and we see a prolonged decrease in that, which is a positive thing. But it's also why uh, the most of the regulatory bodies in horse sports competition are saying that you should wait a little bit before you compete the horse after you've used shockwave on it. And so uh, FEI, the Federation of Equestrian International, which governs international equine sports, uh, has a, a five day time frame. Racing has a five to 10 day time frame. And then um, USEF has a three day time frame of which you can treat the horses, but then they should not compete. And that's because of substance P. Um, we don't want the horses feeling artificially good and going out and competing, but we want to give time for that cytokine soup to be initiated, which is actually helping heal the process. Um, so I'm going to go ahead now and talk about these two things. I'll just back up one second. We talk about two main things that we are looking at as how shockwave's working. One is pain management, okay? We're just trying to get the horse feeling better so it can get back to exercise, which is the physical therapy of the horse. Um, and then soft tissue injury, where we have the cytokine soup. Now, when we look at a bone like this, and this is a segment of the lumbar vertebrae, and what you see where those red arrows are, you can see to the far right there, there is a normal, and that's an articular process of the lumbar vertebrae, and then look to your left where that arrow says abnormal, 
and what you're seeing is those are quite abnormal um, and we don't want to see anything like that but when we do it's difficult to deal with it and so one of the ways that shockwave is really good besides making that cytokine soup in the tissues it does that here when we shockwave these structures but the other thing that it does is normal bone such as those that joint on the right has very few pain receptors but abnormal bones, such as the one on the left, has a lot of them. And so, you know, we don't, that's gonna make the horse more painful and use its back less and cause muscle, muscle atrophy. So when we shockwave that area, then what we get is complete downregulation of those pain receptors. And so it essentially knocks them out uh, those abnormal number of pain receptors and down regulates them to a normal number and it does it very quickly uh, while we're doing the shockwave process and they don't they always come back but they won't come back for some months which gives the horse the opportunity to get back into work and start doing better and feeling better and what we always say in back and I'll show you some examples of that is the goal is to break the pain spasm cycle, spasm being the muscles, um, and relax the musculature, let the horse get back to work, and start growing muscle to help replace the abnormal bone. No one, um, horse veterinarians nor human physicians, can get rid of arthritis. Once it's there, it's there. And so from there on, we, we can help heal it by letting the joint come back and be as normal as it can be, and then letting the horse get back to work. And eventually, we get muscles that get in there, get stronger, and do the work that the bone and the joint used to do. Uh, so that's the only way of really managing it. Um, so when we talk about it for neck pain, cervical pain, um, this is how we're using it. We're using it at a high setting. Um, our depth is about 20 millimeters. And uh, we're going to focus on either the articular facets in the neck or the pole. And there where you can see the red arrow pointing is a big spur uh, off of that. The, that's the the back of the head, and so it's called the external occipital protuberance, uh, and that's a big spur that shouldn't be there that's attached to the nuchal ligament, which runs the length of the neck. Um, and so that can give the horse some real discomfort, particularly as they're trying to come down into the bit. Um, so what we do with that is we shockwave it, and we move the probe around, uh, during the treatment, and we can repeat that if need be. Um, if we're going to repeat it, typically it's five to six months later, sometimes as early as 30 days if it's very severe, sometimes as long as one year. But the reality is a lot of these we treat once and don't ever have to treat them again, uh, which is really significant. So now what you're hearing is the shockwave firing, and um, it's fairly loud. We use ear protection when we're doing this. Um, and if you watch, you're going to find, see that reaction right there? We were on a little bit of an arthritic area, and so the horse will flinch when you get there. And again, we know where those areas are because we've worked this horse up and we have have x-rays and ultrasounds of it and sometimes we have already here injected this neck either with cortisone or with platelet-rich plasma and one of the papers that's come out has shown that if you shockwave after using platelet-rich plasma it has a, a very positive effect uh, and it activates the PRP, the shockwave does. Uh, 
Um, when we shockwave the back, I, I'm not going to make you listen to that again, but this is an example. And this is one of my veterinarians who's shocking the back as she's going along and she's doing it right on the midline. And then that's for the dorsal spinous processes, what horsemen call kissing spines. And uh, that treats that. And then if you slightly oblique, you get down to those dorsal articular processes of which I showed you the skeletal specimen earlier. Um, and typically we're using the 35 millimeter probe. And then if the horse is quite a big horse um, and, and toward the back, lower aspect of the back, uh, we'll use the 80 millimeter probe where the joints become very deep there. Um, and again, depending on how we how often we use it, most typically is five to six months. We'll repeat it again, um, but it can be variable depending upon the horse and the condition. And like I say, usually even before we start shockwave, we know where we're going uh, because we have x-rays or a bone scan, or we have ultrasound in the area. So what are our successes and our complications of shockwave? And, and it's been very successful, and I'll show you some numbers here in a little bit. And uh, when I say partially successful in the soft tissue, it, it, soft tissue is always difficult. The bony areas you'll tend to be more successful on, the soft tissue areas tend to be more challenging. Um, and that's true not only in the back area, uh, the good news is there are not near as many soft tissue areas in the back, most of them are bony. Um, but in the proximal suspensory, which I'll show you some examples, those, you know, if we can achieve 60% success rates, we're pretty happy because even surgery or much more invasive techniques are only going to be in the 70%. So not much better, 60 to 70%. If there's another lameness problem, you have to treat that. So if we're talking about the back here, um, if there's a hock problem or a front end problem or a stifle problem, you've got to treat that because back problems cause poor performance. They don't cause lameness. So if there's a lameness, it's due to another reason and it behooves the veterinarian then to figure that out and then you can get on with treating it. Um, and then sometimes we'll use mesotherapy, which is another pain suppression technique where we use very small needles just under the skin inject a solution and that seems to have a synergistic effect um, in treating backs with shockwave therapy. So here's a study that we did at our clinic and and actually we keep track of this. Our, we're up to between six to seven hundred horses now so we cut this off um, some years ago and tabulated these results, but they've been interesting. Uh, we had uh, these 300 some horses presented with back pain. 57% were presented for lameness, but actually only 32% were lame by our standards. Um, so 92% were positive to back palpation in the manner that we do it at our clinic. And then we use also a weighted surcingle um, to look as a functional test for back pain. And 90% of them were positive to that as well. Now, so we treat it with shockwave and we treat it with other things too, and I list them all here. Um, but of the 122 horses that were just treated with shockwave alone, 90% of those horses remained in work or returned to work uh, over a period of time. Um, and then 75% uh, of the, or 75 of the horses uh, were treated with interspinous space 
corticosteroid alone. Um, and then 96 of those percent returned to work. And then some also had guided articular injections. Again, very successful there. Mesotherapy, successful there. We Nowadays, we tend to use mesotherapy in conjunction with shockwave more often. And then of the horses that receive no treatment, again, physical therapy is also useful. And so 60% of those. And remember, we're asking the clients how those horses did. Um, and so you've got to remember, while horses have no placebo effect, their human caretakers remarking on them still have that 40% human placebo effect. Um, so um, that explains the 62%. And if you look at the red bar here, where I've circled the shock wave, this was 241 of the horses received treatments, but you remember from the previous slide, uh, 122 of them received it alone. The 241 reflects the horses that had other treatments, such as interspinous injection, articular injection, IV Tildren, or nowadays also Ospos, um, mesotherapy, or no treatment. But if you look at the shockwave column, uh, you see the horses that we had follow up on, and the percentage of return to work is very high. And actually, if you look at the breakdown of that, we say that all of those horses were able to return to work in some fashion. Um, and then the ones that didn't return to work did it for a separate issue. Um, so what the takeaway from that is, is medical management of back pain is very successful in keeping a horse in work. And it, it's frankly much higher than surgery. People talk about surgery. Surgery cases, there's a paper out there that claims 85%. Certainly most of the people I know doing that procedure can't seem to reproduce that 85%. They're usually down around the 50% level. Um, and so you tend to want to only do surgery when you can't manage it medically, like you would normally anyway. No one wants to go to surgery have their horse be knocked down and have a procedure uh, if they can avoid that. So shockwave for pelvic pain, um, we can look at that and we can shockwave and pelvic pain is the sacroiliac joint. Um, and for that, we're gonna use our highest setting, the 80 millimeter probe. You can see I've got probes there that are showing where we're doing the shock wave, and there are four sites there where we can do that. Um, and then what we're going to do is direct 500 pulses at each of those sites. Um, and then we can sometimes use our ultrasound machine to help direct our angle of our shock wave, and then we may need to repeat that in two to six months. Um, when we talk about soft tissue injuries in the limb, one of the primary ones we talk about is um, shockwave therapy in the proximal suspensory ligament. And here you can see that red arrow, which is at an oblique angle on where, and you can see where the probe is located there. The proximal suspensory is just below the hock on the back of the cannon bone. And you can see that red arrow directed, that's where we direct the shock wave toward that proximal suspensory, which you can see there in the middle part of the um, screen here. And uh, that shock wave is directed in there at the proximal suspensory. And that's where we're talking about that cytokine soup uh, that we want to, to kind of stir up in the tissues so that we start the healing process. And uh, then to your left, you just see an anatomical uh, specimen of the proximal suspensory. Um, so again, we go back to a couple of papers that are relevant here. 
The first one was uh, Scott McClure, published 2004, and he went ahead and created a research model of suspensory desmitis by injecting collagenase in there. He then um, followed, he shockwave some of them and didn't shockwave the other group. And what he found was the treated limbs had more rapid filling of the defect. And that was because shockwave was activating the fibroblasts via the cytokine soup it was stirring up. And then uh, a paper we did uh, with Amy Norville as the lead author at our clinic was we collected over a period of years several cases and uh, I'll show you a quick example of that. Um, we actually had hundreds of these cases, but a lot of them were referred cases. We didn't have follow-up. So in the end, we came down to 75 cases we had great follow-up on. And we said, okay, well, what's the difference between surgical treatment and shockwave treatment of proximal suspensory desmitis in the hind limb? And the hind limb proximal suspensory is much more difficult to deal with than the front limb. Um, and so here are some papers which have talks about surgery being 78%. Uh, this is an English paper. And then um, another paper, 87% now. No one's yet been able to replicate that 87%, uh, but that's Nat White, who's a very good surgeon, did a lot of our cases. Um, and then Shockwave, Crow's original report on it was 41%. And sadly, this particular problem in horses does very poorly with rest, as Dyson reported back in the early 90s, um, that only 14% of the horses get better with rest. So if we're looking at our outcome here, you know, how did we do it? We rehabilitation we thought was an important thing and so you can see how we rehabilitated them the surgeries had two to four weeks stall rest four to six weeks hand or ride walk small paddock turnout and then we would evaluate them and determine if we would start them moving more rapidly and we would evaluate them every month the shockwave had six weeks ride walk small paddock turnout and then an additional four weeks after the last shock wave, we did three shock waves three weeks apart. And then at the end of that, we looked at them and we decided where we would go with that particular case. Um, and so what you find is that in the surgery, 41 cases and you see 58.5 were soon previous level of work. And you go down to the shockwave, 34 cases, 58.5. They were identical, which was a surprise. Um, and so, uh, you know, some of these did remain lame and required additional treatments of varying types. And if the shockwave failed, we tended to go to surgery. If the surgery failed, we tended to go to shockwave. Um, so, both of these were pretty equal, about 60% chance that shockwave or surgery is going to finish it out. There's another paper that we, we're participating in, and it's going to come out with shock, or sorry, surgery is going to be at about 70%. But either way, if you're only separating that by 10%, that's probably not a statistical difference. Um, so duration of recovery, uh, and again, duration with surgery was about 10 months, um, with shockwave it was seven months. And if you had to switch therapies, in other words, shockwave failed and you had to go to surgery and rehabilitate again, then the combined turned into 18 months. Um, now, in the modern, more modern era, this was just a few years ago, you can see, um, we tend to get these horses back into work. Um, we're evaluating them at about 90 days. We're starting to ramp their work up if they're doing well. 
and then we're happy to get these horses back into full exercise by somewhere between five and six months. So here's our soft tissue treatment protocol. We provide um, three shockwave treatments, uh, two to four weeks apart. The most common is we pick the middle three weeks. Um, so three times, three weeks apart, controlled exercise is key, quiet, small paddock turnout, let them be a horse, but they can't run around, and then ride or hand walking um, is, and with the preference being ride walking. Sedation is sometimes required. They're gonna be in the stall. Uh, you can use medroxyprogesterone or reserpine, and then um, if you're taking them out of the stall, then usually acepromazine, and then a complete reevaluation 30 days after the last shockwave. Um, and that includes doing an ultrasound to see how they're doing. So here are some case examples. Um, it's a nine year old Welsh pony. And what we saw with it was, again, the most common complaint we see with backs, which is decreased performance. And the pony isn't right, doesn't jump as well as it used to. You can see it's a very cute little pony. Um, and so a moderate response to palpation of the back and the sacroiliac area. Um, this is a bone scan showing this area here in the dorsal articular processes, which has some inflammatory process. Um, and so we're we're looking at that and we're concerned that that's arthritis, like what I showed you on the skeletal specimen. Um, there's the arrows pointing at it. And so what we saw, if you look at these dorsal articular processes here, you don't see here in the center of the slide, you don't see the joints as well as you should see them. And so, that concerned us and we said that's an arthritic change within those joints. There you can see the arrows. So we shockwave the back, 1500 pulses, E6, which is the high energy level, 35 millimeter probe. And it, the pony was most reactive at 14 thoracic vertebrae, 14 through 18. And that indicates kind of a focus area that we had seen uh, and it corresponds with our imaging findings and this pony successfully returned to work did not need further treatment went on down the road and that is quite common in the outcome of these horses um, this was an 11 year old warm blood mare doing dressage um, and she was lame on the left hind on the straight and lunging to the left and then was moderate on the left hind upper limb flexion, had some pain and thickening in the proximal suspensory area of the left hind leg. Um, now, these are various blocks that we've done trying to localize where the lameness is, and a low four point or distal metatarsal is one that would be above the fetlock joint and would take out the fetlock on down. Um, and so you can see the lameness remained unchanged here. Um, on the deep branch of the lateral plantar nerve, which is one that's fairly specific uh, for the proximal spensary, we block that. We got a 75% improvement, which is quite a good improvement. And then the horse now became lame on the right hind, and then we blocked um, the right hind as well. So we did ultrasound now, and what you see on the left, you look at that sloping line, which is the cannon uh, bone, the back of the cannon bone where the proximal spensary attaches. And what we see is there's a rough and irregular surface there. Um, doesn't exist here. Both of these are darker, these tendon and ligament areas of the proximal spensary are darker than what we would like to see. Um, these are transverse ultrasound views, and 
they're just showing that both of these ligaments, but more the left than the right, are enlarged. And then these are the, the radiographs of the hock and showing a little bit of sclerosis at the top of the cannon bone where that proximal suspensory attaches in both right and left. So here's our treatment, three shock waves, both hind proximal suspensories, three week intervals. We ride walk the horse three to five times a week. Um, and then we recheck, source also had quiet small paddock turnout. If they won't tolerate quiet small paddock turnout and they're running around, then we just give them more ride walk and keep them in the stall after that, if that's what we have to do. We prefer not to do that. Now we recheck then 30 days following the third shock wave. And what we saw was, you know, the left hind lameness is improved. Um, and both of them are flexing better, but we were concerned based upon our previous x-rays that there was also some low-grade hock arthritis. And so we wanted to get rid of that influence as well so we could go ahead and say, well, yes, this horse has a hock problem and a proximal spensary. We need to deal with both of them. And it is not uncommon that you will see the problems concurrently uh, in the same horse. So case three, a nine-year-old warm blood mare. Um, she's a low-level dressage horse, got some head shaking behavior, doesn't want to come into the frame or bend the, the head down into the bit uh, and accept the bit is what we'd call it. Uh, and was a little painful on palpation over the pole. Now, when you look here, this red arrow is pointing to the external occipital protuberance, which should be a very nice, sharp demarcator. And you can see how blunt it is. And that's all that bony remodeling and fragmentation that's going on. So what we did there is we went ahead and shocked that just like that. Um, and it's, we usually use a 20 millimeter probe at a high energy rate for about a thousand pulses. And that was very successful. Um, at a recheck at 30 days, horse very happy, not coming into the frame. In this case, sometimes we don't repeat it. In this case, we did for six month intervals for two years. And then the horse was good enough that the lady hadn't brought it back since. Um, this is a 13 year old quarter horse, a venter, um, two of her five right front. This horse is rehabbing from a left front suspensory branch injury, a little lower in the cannon bone area, um, and a horse blocked to the heel, PDN posterior digital nerve block. So we look at it and we see, I mean, there's some angles in here that I'm not real fond of kind of a broken back hoof pastern axis and not great chewing in that we have a little bit of a palmar downward sloping heel. So we want to do shoeing to fix that, but we also want to treat the problem. And the problem turned out to be the um, lateral collateral ligament of the coffin joint. And so this uh, right front lateral side is enlarged. You can see if you compare it on the left to the medial and then the lateral and then on the further right slide is it's definitely enlarged and darker than what you would expect to see. Um, so we did a shockwave session on that collateral ligament three times, three weeks apart, 20 millimeter probe, high energy level, a thousand pulses. Sound at recheck four months after the treatment's completed. Case five is a eight year old thoroughbred mare, low level eventing, bucking under saddle, refusing jumps. Uh, there's a severe reaction on palpating the back here. Um, and 
So we look at this and you can see the slide here, sorry. Um, the upper slide is showing impingement of the dorsal spinous processes. And the horseman term for that is kissing spines. Um, and so then if you look down at the bottom, if you look to the right, you notice how you can see the joints in between the vertebrae. As you go to the left, you notice how they kind of blur out and you don't see them very well. And so that's arthritis off to the left and more normal to the right. So this shockwave of the thoracolumbar spine was performed. Uh, 1500 pulses, 35 millimeter trode, E6, and then we did 500 with the uh, 80 millimeter trode, the deeper trode. So we rechecked at 30 days. We thought it was improved. Um, and then um, this horse then surprisingly is now lame in the right front where it wasn't before. Um, and lameness resolves with a foot block, uh, abaxial sesamoid. And so we blocked that and the horse went lame on the left now. And that's not terribly uncommon, you'll see that. And what you see with those circle there is this horse has some low grade ring bone. Um, so we treated that and we did um, repeated shockwave therapy of the back. We did interarticular corticosteroid injections of the coffin joints as they were involved. And then we shockwave that right pastern. And then 30 day recheck, the horse much more comfortable through his back, developed moderate size medial splint on the left. And then we performed shockwave on the medial splint. So, you know, it's acquiring problems, which is sometimes the case with horses that won't stay quiet in rehab um, and they'll injure themselves further. Um, and, but it happened to be that every time this horse injured itself, it was an injury that we could treat with shockwave, which non-invasive always better, and the horse did respond. Um, so then this case six, five-year-old warm blood presented for bucking after jumps, swapping leads behind, um, was sound on the moving exam, um, you know, mild to moderate response to upper hind limb flexions, fairly comfortable on palpation of the dorsal spinous process, but a moderate response, uh, response to palpation over the tuber sacrali, which is the sacroiliac area. Um, so what we did here is we shock waved the sacroiliac joint and we did mesotherapy over that pelvic area. And then we started the horse on a series of adequon. Um, doing well, um, still occasionally bucks after jumps, but they say is much improved. So these are some references of some of the papers I've referenced here uh, during this. And um, that's what I have. Uh, any questions we have, Michelle? Hi there, that was great. Thank you so much for your lecture. I just want to plug my headset back in because my dog has just pulled it out of my computer. <laughs> As I was saying, we have these gremlins happening constantly. One second for me. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great stuff. I do have some questions for you. So while anyone else is, if you have any more questions, please type them into your questions box while I start to read these off for you, Kent. So my first question here is, um, which, is the, which is the main difference between laser therapy and shockwave therapy? So basically what they're wanting to know is type of wave, frequency, and uh, the frequency of the wavelength. Yeah, and that's a good question. Um, again, as I described shockwave, shockwave is sound wave energies. And so it's very intense, low frequency sound waves. Um, and, and then you have to have a coupling gel 
to go ahead and, and get it coupled to the skin so it can get to the deeper tissues. Laser is lased light or coherent light, okay? Uh, you know, regular light, you flip on an incandescent bulb, that's not directed coherent light. That's just light scattering everywhere. Coherent light is all, the photons are all headed in one direction. Um, and so that's what laser is. Um, and laser is also useful. And uh, again, they have various one through four classes of laser. And then you go into the, above that, you go into the surgical versions of laser. Um, so it's coherent light in the different classes denote the intensity of it. Um, so what we've found is we use both shockwave and laser class four, very intense, uh, coherent light to rehabilitate horses and often on similar type lesions. And sometimes we use it together. Now with say the class four lasers, those have to be done multiple days. Say we do them three days a week. Um, so you either have to have access to the horse, or the horse has to come back to the clinic. Um, and where shockwave, there are larger gaps in between uh, the treatment times. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Some of these questions did come through early on in the webinar, so I'm just going to ask them. You may have covered them, but I might, uh, I may just ask them again anyway. Sure. Um, Another one that's just popped through, um, a question on back palpation. What is your experience with horses that are not very sore on palpation, but non-responsive or, non or rigid sometimes it seems, like these horses are bracing against palpation or might be sore as well? Um, and then she goes on to say, thanks for a great webinar. Um, yeah, so what is your opinion yeah. on that? Well, and, and in the, the talk, uh, I mentioned that we palpated the back and we try very hard to get just on the dorsal spinous processes, the bony uh, protuberances coming through the back, the middle part of the back, and push on those only. And then we go back and palpate the soft tissues separately trying to differentiate between bony and soft tissue. Um, and they're right. Um, it is challenging sometimes. These horses will learn to brace their back so you can't downward deflect the back, which is what causes the pain because they're trying to stop you from hurting them. Um, you know, we're trying to do diagnostics, not hurt them, obviously. Um, so what we do is we use this weighted surcingle. Um, and what we've learned over the years is it's a functional test for back pain. And so as opposed to having someone ride the horse for us, which is useful, uh, but this way I have no rider controlling the head or the legs. Um, and I just see the horse, a girth, which induces some back pain on painful horses and then weight and so i get a real functional feel for how the back pain really is without the horse kind of fooling me okay um my next question here can shockwave therapy use near an area with a metallic implant you can use it in those areas. You do want to probably lower the power um, and um, and then just be a little ginger about it because the horses are really stoic about shockwave. I can tell you I uh, almost every veterinarian who's used shockwave will eventually be uh, dumb enough or smart enough to use it on themselves. And I can tell you it's fairly painful in uh, on humans and we don't tolerate it that well. Um, yeah. There are medical approved uses of it, but it's painful. Um, yeah. Horses tolerate it really, really well. Um, now, some of the few exceptions to that would be metal implants and also what's called 
uh, buck shin in racehorses or a saucer fracture. And those horses are very painful when you find that area. And they're going to tell you about that. Um, and you're going to have to sometimes sedate them heavily, occasionally even block it. Uh, now, the second time you do it, they'll do much better. Uh, but the first time, it's fairly painful. So be careful around implants, turn the power way down, and kind of work around the edges. Be careful. Okay, thanks very much. So um, my next one is, in South Africa, a number of shockwave therapists are convincing horse owners that shockwave will relieve muscle tension and can be used preventatively prior to competition. Um, another and other um, than man, than NLG. Oh, sorry, I'm reading this wrong. Let me put adjust okay. the glasses here. Um, and other than analgesic effect, does ESWT have any physiological effect on muscle tissue? Sure, the cytokine soup that we were talking about it'll generate that in uh, muscle tissue as well. We had a horse recently that was a high level jumper that tore um almost completely avoles the long head of the triceps muscle at the elbow and we did shockwave and laser that horse was too lame to ship back home um and we through a combination of shockwave and laser two months we had that horse completely sound and the the large tear that we could see on ultrasound had gone down, started out the size of a cantaloupe, had gone down to the size of my thumb. Um, so, yeah, you're going to get the cytokine soup that you want in muscle tissue, too. It's just that if it's just some muscle soreness, honestly, you don't need shockwave for that. That's kind of like uh, going squirrel hunting with a bear gun, you know. It's overkill. You don't need to do that. You can do that with massage and some simple things. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I like, that's I like that reference. Much. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that one on my husband for something. I'm going to remember that. Um, in your experience, um, is there any difference in having the limb front or hind in flexion or not during the therapy ECSW? Um, of the P PSL region, do you believe you could enhance penetration towards the PSL or um, palmar plantar cannon bone with the limb inflection? Uh, you know, the limb inflection, as most of us know, is very effective on doing your ultrasounds. It helps in that manner. Um, and on horses that won't tolerate shockwave with the limb down, then I certainly will go ahead and pick it up and do it in flexion. Um, but I haven't found an advantage to doing it in flexion. And again, these those shockwaves are so powerful and at such short duration that they penetrate the tissues and they don't really care whether that tissue is in flexion or a stance phase um, or up. They don't care. Okay, um, right, uh, with soft tissue lesions, how are you using class four laser and shockwave concurrently? A little bit like what we were talking about before, um, you know, we will, let's say on a proximal hind limb suspensory, um, if we have access to the horse and can laser it, then we will shockwave that horse at three month intervals, uh, three times, and then for at least a month after the initial injury, we will go ahead and three times a week, we'll use a class four laser, uh, class three B if you don't have a class four. Um, and then we would do that three times a week for a month uh, and then reevaluate as to whether we wanted to carry on with laser or not. Okie dokes. Is there a resource that indicates what energy level and how many pulses a particular body part needs? Um, again, the companies are a wealth of information on this. And of course, you know, it, you, you know you'd love for research um, or for publishing papers, 
we do calculations in the uh, millijoules uh, per millimeter squared. Now, in the real world, what you do is you set the energy setting and then you pick the appropriate probe depth. And then, it, then it's all about um, moving the probe while you're doing it, as you saw in the video. Um, so the best resources for that, honestly, are going to come from the companies um, and then the published papers. There's not really a manual. When I started out, I went and looked at a lot of human research because we didn't know what we were doing in equine. Uh, but we're kind of past that now, and the companies have really good information that they can give you, including that one sheet that I was showing you at the very beginning. So reach out to the company that you're working with. Um, PulseVet, I know, has that information available. Okay, that's great. Um, all right, let's have a look. I think this is one last question. What is the optimal um oh we've just done that one haven't we at the optimal time i think that is it and i see alfredo's here again as always hi alfredo it's so good to, um, to see you and alfredo saying thank you so much for this webinar and for doing such a thorough webinar is loving it everyone is sending thank yous to you dr ken thank you very much and i must say a huge thank you to our sponsors